Hebrews 10. And we're going to start in verse 19 tonight. So let's get, let's get into this. And uh, I, I am excited about this word tonight. So let's read together. And uh, we've just been going verse by verse through Hebrews. It's been really fun. And tonight, I guess if there's a main theme that I really was touched about uh, on behalf of you, and we'll get there in a second, um, is dealing with some guilt. Some guilt. So if you have some guilt in your heart, if you have some things that try to creep up and they try to raise their head about your past, we're going to deal with that tonight. But we'll get there in a minute. But let's start in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, say confidence, confidence. to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, comma, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body. So there's a lot there. So let's look at that. So we have confidence to enter the whole, most holy place, but is that confidence in us? No, it's confidence through the blood of Jesus. Not by our good works, lest any man should boast, but only by the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Amen? Amen. So that's the confidence we have. The problem I have is when I talk to people and I see them sometimes are coming into church and they're looking down and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they say, man, I'm just... I'm just struggling. And as a pastor, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with the struggle. I'm okay with the messy. In fact, I think that's why God put me here was to, to help guide you through that. But nine times out of ten, I talk to them, and they're, they're like, Pastor Joseph, I messed up. I, I, I failed, you know. Or this, this old sin that I thought that I had, you know, overcame, it, it crept back up. And they walk in looking like they got a backpack on their back full of weights, and, you know, they're not carrying anything at all. And you can almost see the weight on people sometimes. And I've got good news for you. It's not by your good works. It's only by the work of Jesus Christ, by his blood, by his blood, by his blood. Now listen, it says something next. It says, through the curtain that is his body. So you all seen curtains, right? It's not just talking about decorative curtains, you know, bed, bath, and beyond, you know, like something like that. This is a reference to the curtain that was in the temple, on the temple mount, in the most holy place there was the elements that only the high priest could go in and offer sacrifice once a year for all of the people of God. So imagine that. We can't go to the presence of God. If we were, you know, following Jesus in the time of Jesus, we were, we were considered Hebrews. We were Jews, all right? So we were following the Jewish faith. That means there was a priest that we were following. Even Jesus' own disciples didn't understand what he was saying. Because they just thought he was another rabbi or teacher. It took them a long time to really break in to their psyche and make them understand, no, listen, I am not just a priest. I am not just a high priest. I am the final high priest. I am everything. And he's telling them who he is over and over. And it's like the disciples are like, okay, but who are you? <laughs> and we laugh at them because we have historical context. And we know that Jesus did go to the cross and he died and he rose again and he paid our price. And then 40 days later on Pentecost, we know that the Holy Spirit came and that the Holy Spirit comes and becomes resident inside of us at the moment of salvation. And yet we do the same thing. With all of that historical context, we do the same exact thing as the disciples. Like, Jesus, are you sure you're enough? So we like to laugh at them like, oh, those silly disciples, you know, they were always questioning Jesus. You do it too. Come on. But how much more should we be steadfast in our knowledge and in our foundation and in the knowing, knowing beyond knowing that Christ paid it all. With all of the evidence laid before us. But we waver. It's the enemy's trick. Because he can't take your salvation. That's a secret the church needs to get out. Your salvation can't get snatched from you by the devil, friends, okay? Your salvation is deep and wide and strong. It is a deep platform, a long platform. You're not just knocked off it, okay? You can't just slip and lose your salvation here, all right? Now listen, we did a whole teaching through Romans through the summer. You might want to look at that because we talked a lot about what salvation is and how you get it. But you need to quit being afraid that you're just, you know, on shaky ground with God. You are in the process of sanctification. 
And sometimes you're going to have some, tr- some trials and some temptations. And in a moment, I want to talk about the difference between slipping or being tempted or having a moment of failure versus submitting to a lifestyle of sin. Because there is a difference. And we're going to get there. But the curtain that it's talking about is that veil that is a separation, not just some little curtains. You know when you go to a hotel and they have those curtains that block out the light? You guys ever been to like a hotel? Those are awesome. And you can sleep in. Anybody got those in your house? That's a thicker curtain than most curtains, okay? But the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was a thick material. Thicker than any human could ever tear. And when Jesus breathed his last upon the cross, from top to bottom, that curtain was torn in two. As Christ, the Son of God, God in flesh, breathed his last and died on the cross, he was literally torn. His flesh was ripped. As they whipped his back, it exposed his ribs and even his intestines, and it exposed him. And it wasn't this pretty picture that you see on crosses of rappers at the hip-hop music awards, you know, thanking Jesus that they just wrote some song about booty sweat, you know, like, (laughs) which bothers me, you know, hey, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for helping me write booty, booty, booty all the time. He did not help you write that. No. Stop it. They got this diamond cross on with Jesus on there. Listen, it says he was beaten beyond recognition. All right? So, In the same way that in the temple, God tore that veil that said, you can't go into my presence. At the same moment, we were tearing apart his son. Jesus became the torn curtain. And as Jesus' flesh was torn from him, so the separation between us and God's presence was torn in two. Someone say amen. And then he says in verse 21, and since... We have a great high priest over the house of God. This great high priest, Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, sat down at the right hand of God. Now this is interesting that Jesus would go and sit down. Because in a high priest's duties, he would have never been seen being seated in front of anyone. It was kind of part of their culture. Symbolizing in in public, like if I'm a high priest, you never see me sit anywhere, especially when I'm about my priestly duty. And this was a physical symbol that these priests would do, acting out the fact that the work of salvation for the people that they were doing on the behalf of the people, the slaying of lamb's blood and doves and sacrifices, never ended. It was a physical action. They would never sit. And so when it says Jesus went into heaven and he sat down, what was he saying? He's saying, my work is done. (laughs) Boom. He sat down and said, there's no more work to be done. There's no more sacrifices to be had. Father, all of these that claim my name, just take my payment. The sin debt that they owe of death, Look at my hands. Look at my side. It's paid for and it's done. Yeah, you can thank God for that. But the writer of Hebrews, and I love the writers of the writer of Hebrews. He's my favorite or she's my favorite because we don't know who it is. Hebrews is an interesting book. Some people try to say it's Paul, but scholars would agree that it is in a way, as far as its grammar and its writing flow and its thoughts, a little bit beyond Paul's writing abilities of any of his other works. And his style isn't in here either. So we're, we're not exactly sure who wrote this book, which to me actually makes it even cooler. Because ultimately the Holy Spirit wrote every book. So there's a mystique and a mystery around Hebrews that I love. He says, since, or she, I don't know, we have this great high priest over the house of God. Since you've been saved, and then he's going to list some stuff. So get ready to write this down. Number one, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. So a sincere heart. So put away the pretense. Just sincerity. God looks straight to the core of your intentions. And with full assurance that faith brings. So a sincere heart through faith. There is something that faith brings, a belief that God did it all. I love that. 
having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse from a guilty conscience. Now, I want you to underline sprinkled and a guilty conscience because those are both keys in this verse. Having our bodies washed with pure water. And I want you to underline pure water because you might not understand what sprinkled and pure water and guilt is. What, what is it talking about there? I want to break that down for you. A guilty, yes, you're welcome, Alex. That's Alex, right? I just know from your voice. Thank you. So manly. Wow. No problem, Alex. I got you, buddy. An evil conscience is a conscience that continues to feel the guilt of sin. I wish I could talk like you. I got this high-pitched voice. God made me a preacher with his high-pitched voice. I don't know what he was thinking. And an evil conscience is the conscience still burdened. That's how I sound. Alex, if you preach, you'd be all, you sound good, man. So an evil conscience is a troubled conscience. An evil conscience is plagued by guilt. And guilt can be suppressed and your conscience can be seared. An evil conscience is a conscience diseased by guilt. Because guilt is heavy and guilt has consequences. It's oppressive and it is by its very nature suffocating to the soul. Guilt is an inward and deep thing that affects our hearts and minds and even our spirit. When you are covered in guilt, your mind, your body, your spirit are weighed down with almost like, like a film or a residue that just permeates everything that you say and do and everything you think. Guilt, I mentioned it, not only affects what you are seeing, it projects what you are seeing. Guilt projects onto God too, saying God could never love me. After all, God... God, you remember what I did, you remember what I said, you remember how I acted. And we take and we put these things back on us. But ultimately, I would say that's the enemy of your soul, whispering those thoughts into your heart and into your mind. And when he tries to come and whisper guilt into your heart and into your mind, you need to reject that and wrestle those thoughts out of your mind. Listen, taking captive your thoughts is much like taking captive someone that wants to come into your home and steal your possessions. If someone was to come into your home and steal your possessions, I imagine you'd probably put up a little bit of a fight. Especially if they're coming in and they're going to take my children. You know, they're going to they're gonna try to abuse my wife. You, I don't care how big they are. I'm going to fight back. But the difference is we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the little punk weasel that's trying to come into our house is like a little grasshopper. Man, he's just like, get out of here. All he has is intimidation. Satan is like a grasshopper that's put himself up against a lamp and he's casting this big shadow on the wall. We're like, ah! You need to realize who he is. He's nothing. We win. Don't let guilt sabotage your potential. Yes, you're going to heaven. Yes, you are saved. This is not a salvation issue. Guilt, though, is going to affect the fruit that you're able to produce on this side of eternity. If you're living in a guilty life, then you're not worthy to get up and preach, man. I'm not worthy to lead worship. Man, I shouldn't be a greeter. How could I lead a small group? Why should I go on the missions trip? Why should I start the outreach? Why should I be the leader of this thing? After all, I'm just a loser and I'm just, man, God knows. I just, I'm probably just going to fail again and I'm probably just going to mess up again. Quit talking like that. Guilt will sabotage and guilt will just make you just come and sit in a chair for the rest of your life. One of the most tragic things that could happen to your life is that you get saved tonight and sit in a chair for the rest of your life. My job as your pastor isn't to fill this room, it's to empty it for the sake of kingdom advancement. Every mission field, filled. Every street that needs saved, saved. That's the goal of Upper Room. The goal of Upper Room is to empty this building and not to fill it. And I think that's exactly why you keep coming. Let's fill heaven. But guilt... Guilt is trying to, it's like a lifeguard sitting on the beach and, man, it's like this lifeguard's buff. He's all ripped. He's a swimmer. He's equipped. He knows how to swim. He knows how to save people. This is you. You know the gospel. You know Jesus. You're saved. You have every tool necessary. You know the lifeguard, he's got a surfboard. He's got a little floaty thing. He's got a little red trunks. He's decked out. But someone's drowning. Imagine this scene. Here comes this big Buff, strong, lifeguard. He's trained. He's equipped. He's got all of his stuff. Someone's drowning. It's my time to shine. He comes busting out of that little thing. Ba, 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 ba. And he's going. Ba, ba, ba. He's got his 
chest all oiled up, his six packs glistening. But do do but do do. I'm gonna save you. And then you see what is that tied around his leg? Oh, it's a giant ball and chain. This is the state of the church. You are fully equipped, you are fully trained, you have everything that you need, you know the gospel, and yet you're like, oh, but look what I did. And so you do nothing. Guilt is the major saboteur of the church today. I hate it. Guilt will not allow one to be emotionally or spiritually healthy either. So not only does it affect your calling, it affects your health. So even if you choose to sit on a chair in a church for the rest of your life and do nothing, there is even a greater tragedy because the people that sit in churches and chairs all across the country, not only are they just sitting in chairs and churches, they are emotionally and mentally broken because of guilt. We can live under a great burden of guilt, but we cannot resolve the guilt without the love and the peace that only Jesus can bring. Every psychologist and every counselor, they have their tactics and they have their tools to try to help you. But it is only by the power of the one true living God that he can come. And not only, see what, what social world does, it, what, these, what these psychologists do is they teach you ways to pick up your weights and learn to swim with them. They give you tools to manage your pain. But Jesus says, come here, I got the keys for that. Boom, go free. That's the difference. The guilty soul is a joyless soul. Guilt is like a strong man and it holds the soul captive. And it will not yield to arguments of denial or guilt or cast in solid steel and strength. It allows nothing to break its power. It rules over the mind, over the emotions, over the heart, ultimately over the entire personality. And is deeply affected and attached to this thing called guilt. So, the answer is the sprinkling of blood. Our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience. That was the answer. What does that mean? Sounds kind of gross. The sprinkling refers to the Old Testament priestly rite that is the blood of atonement for sin. The sprinkling of blood was to make atonement for all sin. The meaning is clear. We are to look to the blood of Christ for the full payment of our sins, his broken body, his slaughter, and the sprinkling of his blood. That is the payment. So until you truly learn to rely on the payment that Jesus made and on his blood, and instead of your hard work and your effort, you will never accomplish what you're hoping for. And here's the divine paradox of the upside down kingdom. The divine paradox is this. In all of your effort to be better and do better and strive, you will fail. But when you will focus on Jesus... You will find that all those desires that you have to stop sinning, to live holy, to give God a pure and living sacrifice, when you fix your eyes on him, all of that comes as a byproduct. You know, I ride motorcycles. It's like something I love to do in my spare time. And when I first started learning, somebody taught me, when you're riding your motorcycle, if you're coming around a turn and maybe another car is drifting into your lane, the tendency is to look right at that car. You're coming around a canyon road, and I go up to Isabella quite often, and, you know, cars kind of veer through lanes. And so an inexperienced motorcycle rider will look right at that car, and every time what happens is where your eyes go, your body follows, and they hit it. So they say, no matter how much you want to, even if you're going to hit a tree, you're going to hit a car, look where you want to go. Don't worry about what's coming, and your body will follow. See, many of you guys, all you focus on is I'm a sinner, I'm a loser, I'm just this, I'm just that. And then you hit it, boom, every single time. You're in here worshiping tonight and you're feeling holy, you're feeling the presence of God. You're hearing me tell you, you're holy, you're righteous through Christ and you're starting to believe it. But you know, you came to Upper Room last week and then on Monday you fell in the same sin again. That's the enemy of your soul whispering lies. Cast it out right now and say, no, -uh, this money is going to be different. And I don't care if you've said that for five years, this money is going to be different. There is a tension that we will manage. I'm a student of leadership. I love leadership concepts. I love leading people. I love organizing groups. And I, I love to read about leadership. And there is uh, this idea in leadership that there are tensions to manage and problems to solve. It's one of the main keys of a good leader is figuring out which of these are tensions that we are managing and which of these are problems that we're actually solving. 
Part of the role of a pastor and a leader isn't to fix your problems, it's to manage the tensions of church life that will always be there. And uh, this is something that you have to understand. Is this a tension to manage or a problem to solve? Well, this is another thing because it's not so simple. Jesus Christ paid your sin in full. He paid your price. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ and you are on your way to eternity. And yet, you live in the state of tension where your body and flesh are captive in this sinful world. So my spirit longs to be with Christ and to be holy and yet I am in a body of flesh, a fallen state. This is the tension that you will manage until you die. But through the process of sanctification and the conforming us ever more into his image, I can tell you this, it gets easier. It gets easier. There is some popular teaching now that you can attain that state here on earth. I think that sets people up for failure. I don't think it's biblically accurate. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Give him all of your cares. Give him all of your burdens. And trust him that he will see you through. That's the simple gospel, folks. In this world, you will face troubles. We're told, as we've studied, that temptation will be before us. We're told that in this world, we will have trials. And friends, if you came tonight as the guest of someone, and you're hoping, man, that I would just say something that would encourage you, I hope you're encouraged by this. Jesus loves you. He bought you. He paid for you. And you can receive everything, eternity tonight, if you would just believe that. But let me not sell this short of telling you it will be hard. It will be the hardest thing you've ever done. It will not be easy. Christianity is not a self-help religion. It is a self-death religion. Christianity is die to yourself, die to your ways, die to your wants, die to your desires, die to everything you want, and you get me, Jesus. You get my way. It's better than yours. You get my desire. It's better than yours. You get my dream. It's better than yours. Yeah, but, but I want to marry this guy or this girl. Give him up. Give her up. Yeah, but I, I have plans to go to this college or this school. Give it up. God will give you a better one. I'm telling you. But I, I, I have a plan for my life. Well, God's got a better one. Christianity is, a not, is not intended to help you figure out your goals in life. It's to help you get new goals. Christianity says you have everything, everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. See, Christians, it's really easy for me as a preacher. Like, preaching salvation is my thing. I promise you I could give an altar call in Walmart and 20 people are going to get saved. I promise you. It's just, it's just on my life. I'm not being prideful. It's just something on me. Yeah, I, I have full confidence. If I give a salvation call, people will get saved anywhere I go. It's just something that, that God's done in my life. That's easy. Telling people they're sinners, they're like, duh. I'll, yeah, okay, hi, thanks. You're a sinner and you need Jesus. Okay, yeah, I'll take that, right? Perfect. That's great. Easy. But it's way harder for me to convince you Christians that you actually need to depend on Jesus for everything. It's way harder for, for, for me to convince Christians that, that that sin that you repented of is truly gone. And that you don't have to go back to it anymore. It's way harder for me to convince Christians that you don't have to earn it. And that you never can. Because your desire to earn it is a desire to pay back. And it's actually based in legalism, which is death. But if you'll get your eyes on Jesus, you'll produce more fruit than you would trying to earn it. If you're trying to earn it, that means you're trying to produce fruit on your own accord. Stop doing that. Focus on Jesus and you'll produce more than you would if you were trying. All right. Benefits of a clear conscience are that it restores your soul. It unburdens your heart. It's a life set free from guilt. It's a life set free and filled with joy. It's a clear heart. This is why I got a problem with Christians that aren't joyful. I'm like, you don't get it. Man, it bothers me. Christians are like, well, bless God, I'm a Christian. But I'm mature. I'm about the serious things of the Lord. Real joy is a fruit of the Spirit, and it's also a byproduct of a clear conscience. Don't take yourself so seriously, man. With the heaviness of guilt removed, our eyes are open to God, and we can be emotionally and spiritually healthy. 
Listen, when I took up a room, we had about 20, 30 people in here, and I never, ever talked about growing up a room, and I never will. All I've ever talked about is if we could be healthy. Some of you guys were in that first meeting. I said, I don't care if we grow, and I really don't care if we shrink, because up room goes like this all the time. That's fine with me. Listen, I care if you're healthy. But the cool thing is, healthy things grow. So it's a byproduct. Everything in the kingdom is upside down. It's like give, and it will be given. Somebody smacks you, turn the other cheek. It's totally counterintuitive. Pretty much when you get saved, just do the opposite of what your flesh tells you, and you'd probably be good. <laughs> Bodies washed with pure water. Let's get in on this for a second. So the pure water that he's talking about that cleanses is Jesus. Jesus is the water of life, the water that if you drink of him, you never thirst again. He is the purifying water. It justifies, it sanctifies, and it glorifies. Ooh, that's good. I need like an organ behind me right now. Do we have an organ setting on that thing right there? Like, it justifies. No, 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 no. no. Sorry. Sometimes I wish, but I don't have it. You know, I reels just sitting there. Maybe someday. <laughs> don't do it. I'm kidding. You're so cool. I'm so, you're going to go anyways? Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Jesus is the pure water. You're going to have to find the organ setting. I know you've never used it, so look for it. The only thing you've ever used is the synth setting on that. I know. <laughs> I listen to upper room music. I know how it goes. Some of you guys are here like, this church is weird. Yeah, we are. We like it that way. If you find yourself tonight burdened with a heart filled with guilt, I implore you, lay it down. Lay it down. Lay it down. Come to the one who has sprinkled his blood, every drop of it for you. Come to the one who is the water of life that will purify you and wash you. Enter in in confidence. Don't have any guilt. Don't have anything holding you back. I want to move on here into verse 23. It says this, let us hold unswervingly. I love that word. That's just a cool word. Unswervingly. That was in the Bible. I didn't make it up. It's a real word. Unswervingly. To the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So he's still listing what we should do if we're saved. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess that he is promised and faithful. And let us consider how to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. So this should be on our mind as a church. Like how can I get Tamara to do something good? Like, how can I get Labrina to do something good? How can I get Fred to do something good? How can I spur them on? You know what a spur is? A spur, is anybody from Bakersfield? I thought you guys knew this stuff. Does anybody know what a spur is? Oh, how the mighty has fallen. Bakersfield, y'all don't even know what a spur is anymore. I just went to the rodeo a couple weeks ago at the fair. Get in touch with your roots, Bakersfield. Come on. It's a little thing that goes on cowboy boots, okay? And they use it, right? And you see it in the movies and the cowboy's like, bam, he's jacked in the horse. But that's not the way it is. The spur is gentle. The spur for a horse is just a, it's just a tap. It's a little bit sharper than a boot, but it says, hey, come on, let's get going. That's what we're called to do. We're not supposed to be, you know, jabbing each other in the side. <laughs> that's how a spur is used. If a, if a cowboy was to kick a spur, it goes straight through the horse, man. It hurt the animal. That's it. It doesn't want to hurt it. See, we're supposed to say, come on. You can do it. Let's go. There's something good up ahead. There's a place we're going here. We got vision. We got a calling. We can do something great for the kingdom of God. Amen? And I got to end with this. Because if I would have only preached half of this chapter, you might think I'm a grace-only preacher. There is a strange doctrine and a strange gospel that's being preached right now. And it's being preached by some that you can be saved and you can go on living in sin. And in fact, you can even twist the scripture and take what scriptures you like. If, if there's scriptures that you don't like, you can take them out. 
You can live your lifestyle, even if it displeases God. You can live in fornication. You can live however you want. You don't have to get married. You can have sex outside of marriage. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can go get drunk. You know, when the Bible says clearly that you're not supposed to be drunk. You can go sleep outside of marriage with people, even though the Bible says clearly not. There's all these strange gospels of, yeah, but Jesus loves you and his grace is covering you. If that's your perspective of the gospel, that would be like me saying, I love my wife. We are married. But I'm going clubbing tonight, and I'm going to find me a girl, and I'm going to take her home. And yeah, you know what's going to happen, but I'm coming home to you, baby. My wife is a Latina. I would be dead. Mm -mm. I didn't marry some white girl. We're not going to have a conversation about it. She's going to murder me. This is how many of you treat grace. Jesus loves me, and I just get to live however I want. Because me and Jesus, we got an open relationship. Listen, just because Jesus wore sandals and long hair, he ain't no hippie. He don't want no open relationship with you. It's exclusive, buddy. There is no room for sin. There is no room for debaucherous living. The word is clear. So, I prefaced all that to read verse 26, because you might not like it. Because I don't like it. No, I don't, because I am a grace guy. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I've struggled with this theologically, like, God, how can people that you made go to hell? It's hard. It's hard doctrine, guys. But it says here, if we deliberately keep sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left for us. And you'll find this clear teaching throughout Scripture. You cannot come, put on that ring of salvation like it, like my wife. I got married. I put on the symbol. And I go home with her. We go to our honeymoon. And then all of a sudden I'm like out. I'm gambling off all of our money. I'm doing drugs. I'm high all the time. I'm sleeping with other women. And expect just because I have a ring on my finger to think I'm living out holy marriage. This is the state of the church right now. But I go to church on Sunday. But I even paid my tithes. Yeah, but you're not faithful to your husband. Listen, it's not the fear of a hot-blooded Latina woman that keeps me faithful. It's the passionate, undying, and ever-increasing love for a beautiful Latina woman that keeps me faithful. It's, it's a love for my little bride that I met when she was in high school. Fourteen years later, I love her more. I've never even been close to an affair. I come home every night. I bring my paycheck home. My kids get fed. And I'm not like, hey, babe, I brought my paycheck home again. Yay for me. I didn't cheat on you. Give me a reward, like high five sticker on my chart or something. It's ridiculous. But that's how the church treats Jesus. If you want to be faithful to Jesus, just fall in love with Jesus. That's it. Quit trying to stay faithful to Jesus and go spend time with him, and you'll never want the, the stuff of the world again. It's like Lisa with me. Like, why would she want any other guy? I was hoping for an amen, not an explosive laughter. Because <laughs> when you got the real thing, girl. Stop. I'm just. Listen. Whew. The example goes to a certain extent. Marriage was used more as, as an analogy for what our relationship is more than father, son, brother, anything else. It's the number one. Because it's the closest thing in the heaven of two people saying, I choose you. I'm going to be faithful to you. And my fidelity is not based on our contract. Yes, we have a contract. But my fidelity is based on my love for you. Isn't that a better way to do marriage? And you can fall out of love for somebody when you quit spending time with them and quit appreciating what they are. But I have done so many marriages. I've done hundreds of weddings and people come and I, they look into their, each other's eyes and they're all googly. And they're at the altar and they're just sobbing. They're like, eh, crying. They're so in love. 
And unfortunately, I've been in ministry long enough now. I've been full-time ministry for 14 years that I've seen some of those same marriages that I stood at the altar and I said, I now pronounce you man and wife. It's been enough years now that some of those are not together. They say you changed or you changed or whatever, but nine times out of ten, they lost their first love. They forgot who that beautiful person was, and they started focusing on the fact that they leave the toothpaste open or some stupid thing that doesn't even matter. Every once in a while, there's some big marriage-ending thing like unfidelity or something crazy. But even that typically is rooted in the fact that they lost their first love. Because when you're on your wedding night and you're on your honeymoon, you're not thinking about anybody else. You're so in love. You're captivated. Stay captivated with Jesus. The honeymoon never ends with Jesus. Stay captivated. Some of you big, tough men in here are like, oh, I don't like this analogy. Well, guys, tough is what, he call, is what he calls us. He loves you. Get over yourself, you know. You didn't even know what spurs were. Trying to be manly. There's some more verses in this chapter, but I feel led by the Lord just to close here on this. If you need Jesus and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're not living right, I'm going to give you opportunity to respond. Now listen, there is many churches that have you respond in the quietness of your own heart, and that's fine. That's great. My own theological perspective as I've read the word is there's, there's scriptures like, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. And I don't see any example in all of the New Testament of anybody getting saved in private. It was a publicly confessed thing. It was something that was done. Your faith is not private. This is not just between you and God. There is actually a requirement that you go and tell. Even in baptism, it's supposed to be public. So I believe from reading the Bible that it should be public. And so I'm going to ask you in just a moment to do something public. I'm going to ask you to stand for Jesus because he stood for you. And he went bleeding and naked to the cross for you, for your sin. And there's two categories of people in here. One, you have never known Jesus. I dare you tonight to give your heart to him. Yeah, come on. You're already, it's all good. It's all good. You can come right now. Come on. Yeah, come on. And number two. Number two, number two is this. If you're here tonight and you've fallen away from your first love, give, give me, can my leaders get up here and hug these people? Come on. Are you kidding me? This is beautiful. If you're here tonight and you have slipped away from your first love, you know it. I feel in my heart tonight, it's not just, hey, Jesus, I'm sorry. I want you right now, whether you've never known him or if you've fallen away, you know you're not living right. I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to walk to this altar right now. And I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I want you to do it publicly. Because, listen, I believe if you can't stand for Jesus in a church, how are you going to live it out in the world? I just don't get that. I don't know. Maybe you can, but I don't see how. If that's you, I want you to stand up and I want you to come now. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. We love you no matter what. Come on. I know you're coming. I know some of your hearts are being stirred right now, and you need to make it right. You need to make it right. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. They're still coming. Everybody stand to your feet and keep clapping for these people. Come on. Keep it going. Is there anybody else? You need to get right tonight. I'm telling you. Now is your chance. Today is the day. Here, I see you, man. Come on. I see you. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. If you need to come, come now. I'll give you another moment. You say, man, I'll just do it in my seat. I, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I feel like you need to make a public stand for Jesus. I really do, you know? Just another moment. If you're here, you're not living for Jesus or you never have. Now's your chance. Now's your moment. Come on, come on. I see you. Just open up the circle. Anybody else? Today is the day of salvations, friend. Listen. Hey, check it out. Some people have told me, man, you really harp on salvation. That's a personal thing. It is, I, I dare you. Let's talk about that. Let's have coffee. I think I can prove you wrong. In the Bible. It's not private. It's always public. 
And so I'm asking you right now, today is the day of salvation. If you've not been living for God, make it right right now. Your heart is being stirred. You know, you know you're there. You know, man, I got to make it right. I just want to give you another moment if that's you. No judgment, no condemnation. No one's going to be, be wondering like, man, I wonder what's up with them. No, 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 no. Just another moment if you're here. You know you need to be up here. Three. Two. One. All right, let's pray together. Everybody up here and everybody out there, let's just say this. You know what? And it's not magic. All we're doing is saying what we did when we stood up. We're just putting words to it, okay? That's it. We're declaring our faith. Dear Jesus, tonight I choose you. I repent of my sin. And I choose you. Thank you for drawing me by your Holy Spirit. So now I respond in faith and say yes. You're my God. You're the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No one comes to the Father except through you. I believe this. So forgive me and help me to walk this out as I follow you. Amen. If you're up here, I just want you to go now. There's some smiling, waving people there. We have Bibles for you. We have some information for you. We want to talk to you about baptism. I want you to go right now. We'll only take two or three minutes of your time, okay? We're going to give you a Bible, a couple other presents for you, just to say welcome to the family. Can you guys walk with them now and escort them over? As they go, one more time. Come on. That's awesome. Let's keep it going until the last one's through the door. All right. Come on, they're still going. Yeah. We're so proud of you. We love you. So if you're in the room, you're probably a Christian or maybe a stubborn atheist. Either way, I love you. But listen, we believe... As the Bible says, when the word is preached, that the enemy likes to try to come and he likes to take it. So we always take a few moments and worship, and we're going to sing another song. And I encourage you, hey, if you got to go, it's 730. You know, it's still pretty early. I get it. That's fine. But if you can stick around for a little bit, we're going to worship. And a bunch of those people are going to get baptized. We offer that to them the same night. So if you want to witness some baptisms, they're going to get baptized. If you have to go. I would just encourage you to stick around for maybe two or three more minutes and just ask God this. I am not so presumptuous to think that I just said everything that you need to hear. Say this, God, what are you trying to say to me through that white boy? Just ask him that. Just ask him that. And we're going to sing this song, Holy, There Is No One Like You. And we're going to respond. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those of come on, and holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in one, and show me who you are, and fill me with your heart, and lead me in your love to those
inhabiting your praise. Come on. Open up. Oh, show me. Show me. With your heart in. Come on, one more time. God, you're so good. Father, all this was your idea. It was your idea to tear that veil so that your kids can come back and have fellowship with you, commune with you, to spend time with you. That no longer was it one day out of the year, but it's every day, every moment that we can have fellowship with you through your spirit that lives and dwells within us. So, Lord, as we leave, Lord, we don't leave you, and you're never going to leave us. So we go forth with your spirit inside us, a spirit that's longing and drawing the lost back to you, back into your house, back in through that veil, the body of Jesus, into your immediate and direct presence, Lord. Thank you, Father. You've made a way. And, Lord, you did that to get guilt and shame and condemnation off of us, and it's settled. It's a historical fact that those things are no longer who we are. It's a historical fact that it's done and put away with, and it's dead and buried. And we're not gonna resurrect it by believing the lies and the whispers of the enemy. That everything I was guilty of, it's dead and buried and I am free. And who the sun sets fr free is free indeed. That's you. You just choose to believe it and walk in it. And when you choose to believe and walk in it, you will bear the fruit of that truth. You'll be a son. You'll be a daughter. And everyone will be able to tell. So Father, we just thank you. You shed your blood for us. That in all of creation, the billions and billions of galaxies, you shed your blood for us and us alone. Nothing else was worthy of the blood except us. You saw fit. You said we deserve this because you love us. And so we just receive it. We receive it and we choose to walk in it. And we choose to manifest that love to the world. So Lord, as you go with us, we just bless you guys. We love you. We love you no matter what. We Seriously, we love you no matter what. Be blessed. We're going to baptize some people. If you want to stay around, stick around and pray and intercede as people get baptized. We encourage you guys to do that. But we love you guys. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. amen.